if there are any questions, inshallah, we can take uh, some questions. <clears throat> so you mentioned that the Imam all guides just like the Shaitan misleads um, Imam guides. Does he also whisper? Now the, the Quran mentions that Iblis. Now when we say whisper, of course we're not talking about a literal whisper. We're talking about these, you know, subtle insinuations. It's a type of you know the satanic whisper is this this notion of these negative inclinations that you have in your heart these you know this idea that shaitan makes suggestions to you so in the same way that shaitan has the ability to make satanic suggestions to whisper into our hearts to invite us towards evilness towards evil the imam also has this ability to inspire the heart you know sometimes it could be that you know when you have moments where you feel spiritually recharged and you're motivated to do ibadah you know this could be from the barakah of the imam from the dua of the imam so in the same way that shaitan is a source of misguidance the Imam السلام, even in his ghayba, now of course when the Imam is present, you know, his ability to guide is much more apparent. But even when the Imam is in ghayba, that he is a source of guidance in the same way that shaitan is a source of misguidance. So sometimes when you have an idea to do something good, this could be inspired by the Imam. Is that clear? Thank you. So before the time of the Imams, who would have been the one who would be like whispering these, uh, this kind of guidance into people's heart? You know, the Imams themselves, you know, so for, for example, during, during the time, for example, Amir al-Mu'mineen, the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, salam, we believe that, of course, when, during the time of their Zuhur, you know, they're actively guiding. But that doesn't mean that the Imam السلام, doesn't have a connection with someone on the other side of the world. You know, the, 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 the presence of the Imam, his mere presence is a source of guidance. So sometimes the Imam can actively guide someone through direct communication, and sometimes it can happen in other ways. Uh, I, I meant uh, before the time of the Imam, like before in pre-Islamic times, for example. Also, on oh, the pre-Islamic times, so there would be that that role will be played by Allah's hujjah. So it would be it would be, for example, whoever the hujjah of the time would be. So you know, Musa, Ibrahim, all of these individuals, they represent the antithesis of iblis of shaitan. So you have shaitan in every era as the source of misguidance, and the prophets, the imams, the messengers of every era. You know, they also, they counteract that uh, that misguidance. It's kind of based on the hadith that like, there's always a hujjah on the earth. At all exactly. Times. Because I mean, if you think about it, Allah's justice would dictate that in the sh same way shaitan has access to all human beings and he's able to misguide all people in the east and the west, Allah's representative on earth should also have that same reach yes and even more because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is is interested in guiding us so it doesn't make sense that he would give an ability to iblis that he deprives his hujjah of having thank you and uh, another question uh in uh, verse 44 when it says he who causes death and gives life could that ordering also be a reference to resurrection that life comes after death it could be yeah that's also another way to look at it it's possible yeah so so, so you can look at it as you know allah mentioning death first you know because you know we tend to be heedless of it but it can also be a, the idea that he causes us to die and then he brings us back to life. it could be
Any other questions or comments? A comment, not a comment, just like sure. um, on the alcohol thing that you said, I was just wondering um, for people who work, there are lunch meetings and all that, it's our meetings, um, board meetings and all that, and uh, there's alcohol everywhere. So I'm like, how do Muslims, how can they? Make it a policy that they would that there can be no alcohol when they're present. I mean, they cannot dictate that. So there has to be some ahem and mohim or something, some flexibility. So, so the, the way to resolve this issue is that the Islamic ruling is that you cannot sit, obviously, you can't drink alcohol. I mean, that goes without saying, but you cannot be sitting on a table while, where alcohol is served. Now, so you could be at a luncheon where, you know, there might be a table on the other side where alcohol is being served, but the table that you're sitting at, you know, there's no alcohol being served. And I think that, you know, if, if you mention this to your employer that, you know, for religious reasons, I can't sit at a table where alcohol is being served. I've seen from my experience, you know, with, with friends and family, employers have made that accommodation, you know, for, uh, for their employees who have that religious belief you know I, I have a lot of friends who work in the corporate world and they're very open and honest about this so you know they might have a luncheon but they'll sit you know at another table so they're in the same room but they'll make sure that there's separation between the tables just uh you know to accommodate their muslim employees so i i think that you know i think we have a tendency to underestimate how accommodating you know, people can be if you're very open and honest about your religious beliefs. And sometimes you'll even be surprised. You know, sometimes your non-Muslim employer will become your most staunch advocate. You know, especially if you let them know that, you know, this these I can't sit on at a table where alcohol is being served for religious reasons. You know, I've I've met some very wonderful non-Muslims who will go, you know, will go to great lengths to ensure that you're not you're not compromising your religious beliefs. So as long as there's separation, even if the tables are close to each other, technically from a fiqh standpoint, there is no alcohol being served at your table.